we don't want to sound dismissive of Marlon Tapales, unified champion at Super Bantamweight, IBF and WBA. But if he does indeed go on to fight Naoya Inoue later this year, he is almost certainly going to be losing his belts. I'm sure he is a proud Filipino. The Philippines are a boxing mad country, so it's probably going to do good figures. And that means it's probably going to line to Parlas' pockets that little bit more. It completely makes sense to go for the Inoue fight. But the question the boxing world seems to be asking itself, those who are engaged with these weight divisions, and people who are a little bit more realistic and just don't want to jump into a Javante Davis catchweight abomination, is what's going to happen when Inoue goes up to 126 featherweight? It seems very likely that he will at least have a fight there in 2024. Now, because this division doesn't really have a lot of star power, some people have made the mistake to say that this is a bit of a weak division. That's not true. Featherweight at the moment is a bit of a dark horse. You've got a lot of capable guys here. Most of them are going to average a bit bigger than Inoue frame-wise. It's kind of nothing new there, really. A lot of people were bigger than Inoue at Bantamweight. And the belts are evenly spread uh, between four guys. We've got the two Mexicans, Luis Alberto Lopez, good wins over Josh Warrington, Michael Conlon. He's really found his form. He's 29. He's a bit of a crafty street fighter. Maybe he's number one at the moment. Ray Vargas, another Mexican, actually lost for the first time up at Super Featherweight, but he's retained his WBC belt. Double Olympian Robesi Ramirez, perhaps for a lot of people, the most capable and polished looking of all the champions, currently holds the WBO. And of course, he was on the undercard of Inoue Fulton. And then the man holding the WBA title, somebody Inoue is very familiar with and has been quite complimentary towards regarding his power that he felt inspiring, is British fighter Lee Wood. Going off what would seem to be the, the reasonable schedule, perhaps Inoue could get to two of those guys come next year if after probably defeating Depales, he decides, right, let's just jump up to featherweight straight away. Perhaps it's not too much of a jump. Of course, he's fought with featherweights and probably bigger before in sparring. When he fought Fulton, we got this sense of he really knows where he's at, like physically, strength-wise. He walked right to Fulton as if he knew it was all over already. So just that vibe he's currently carrying, featherweight probably isn't too much of a jump. Now, of course, we're talking hypothetically here. We're assuming that nobody gets injured, that we keep this solid schedule of at least two meaningful fights a year, and things progress nicely. But the glue that could make sure that this sticks together and actually transpires is that Inoue is becoming a bit of a money fighter. He is turning heads. He is getting into more pound-for-pound -pound lists. He keeps living up to his crazy nickname. The champions at featherweight should want to fight him. And also, even if you do go on to lose... If you manage to give him a bit of trouble, because he's been so dominant, your stock will still go up. And then ka you might get a rematch. Now, the two guys I would like to see Inoue fight the most, if they indeed remain champions when he gets up there, are Luis Alberto Lopez, who I think Box Rec says is, what, in about 5'4". Is that right? <laughs> is he shorter than Inoue? But nonetheless, similar frame. And here's a guy who's really proven himself against Warrington, against Conlon. You've got this crafty, tough guy who's got some pop, who's got some moves, who's ballsy, and he's never been stopped. That would be interesting. And the other one who I think many people would agree with would be Cuban Robesi Ramirez. He's got that very nice high guard, kind of like Inoue himself. He likes to bait the counter. I suspect he's not going to be as quick on the draw and maybe not as precise and he'll lose that game. But he's got that bit of class about him. And he's, he's still early in his professional career. With Lee Wood, I don't know actually how much he'd want that fight. Because he knows how good Inoue is. He's made the comment that he doesn't think Inoue might encounter any resistance until he goes up to 130. So is he subconsciously saying there that if I fight Inoue, he's going to run through me? And the other slight problem is that Lee Wood is fighting former IBF champ Josh Warrington later this year. And if Team Warrington get their hands on a world championship again, I can't see them agreeing to fight in Inoue unless they are handsomely rewarded. And an interesting one because of the physical contrast would be against Ray Vargas, who is very rangy. Even more so, though, I think now, against Brandon Figueroa. He was supposed to have that rematch with Stefan Fulton, 
Fulton, of course, ended up getting battered by Inoue. But there's a really rangy guy who keeps coming forward. If Inoue were to blast him out, he just ticks another little box and satisfies some other critics who've said, well, I thought Figueroa edged out Fulton. But what is of most interest to me, I've mentioned this before when it comes to featherweight, which is if the monster goes up to 126 and the knockouts continue to come, look for a shift in general media coverage. Many casual boxing fans will only go low enough to 126, providing you're entertaining. Other people have said they see is too small. So if Inoue can still set people alight at 126, he is going to start to get more of that stardom that he deserves. We know he's very big in Japan, but he does need to try and cross over a little bit. We know he's not going to speak English fluidly, but let's just try and learn a few phrases. Let's work on the smile, yeah? Keep delivering the same stuff. Give out a good vibe. You're going to attract more people. And this will try and chip away at something Eddie Hearn said. He said a few years ago that Naoya Inoue will not become a major star. He sees him and thinks, nah, doesn't speak enough English, too small. Inoue can break those boundaries, especially if he fights in the UK. The likes of Lopez, of course, has already beaten some British fighters in Conlon and Warrington. So if Inoue can come over to the UK fight the likes of Lopez and Lee Wood and blast them, I think that is going to do tremendously for his overall profile. Again, we are talking hypotheticals, but we are kind of talking about something that's very probably going to manifest. Judging by what Inoue did to Fulton, which I think on average, as I've said, was a bit easier than most of us were expecting, there's not a lot there for Inoue at 1-2-2. He is going to be looking to make that jump and for his own sake, for his own pocket and for that thing called legacy, which I think he genuinely cares about. We are going to see Inoue take on some champions at 126 and very probably take them out. But what do we make of what is very probably an imminent jump up to 126? Who would you like to see Inoue fight the most? Who do you think gives him the most trouble? And is Eddie Hearn going to get it completely wrong about the monster? never becoming a global star.